Hello, my name is Amanda Thomas, and I'd like to welcome you to A Scientist Walks Into a Bar. We've taken a bit of a break from producing episodes, but we're back. This podcast features recordings of talks given at Science on Tap, a series of science lectures held in Portland, Oregon, and Vancouver, Washington. This episode is a recording of the talk, The Neuroscience of Trauma, From Trigger Warnings to PTSD, with Dr. Larry Sherman, who is a neuroscientist at OHSU here in Portland. There has been a lot of interest in this topic, and he's given this talk three times to full houses in the past few months. But this particular talk was recorded on November 17, 2015, at the Clinton Street Theater. Here we go. So I, I am a professor at OHSU, and uh, uh, I'm also the president of the Society for Neuroscience for the state of Oregon. And as such, I, I love to give these public talks. Uh, it started with a great talk that I, I love to give because I get to play piano on music and the brain and uh, continued into Love in the Brain as a collaboration with Valerie Day and John Smith and uh, multiple other topics. And so that's why I'm here tonight, as a skeptical neuroscientist, to review the literature on a topic and tell you what I think is good science. A lot of what I'm going to talk about tonight uh, varies from clinical data to psychological data to real neuroscience. Remarkably, some of the things that I'm talking about are actually things I do do in my own laboratory. And uh, so I'll, I'll hopefully get you to share my excitement on some of that. So I, I understand that there are people in here who uh, do suffer from anxiety disorders and PTSD for various different reasons. I, I also understand that there may be some vets in the audience, and I can't see you right now, but if, if you are here, I know some of you probably are easier at standing up than others. Maybe if you're just going to raise your hand if you are a vet. Great. I see a few... I want to say one thing, and that is uh, thank you. Um, and when I say thank you, I don't mean, yeah, everybody, please. Thank you not only for your service, um, and I realize that people may have mixed feelings about that service, but really thank you for your courage, because I know that some of you are still fighting a war that's different from the one that, that you were sent off to fight. I personally lived with a situation like that. This picture is my mom and dad. Closer? Okay. All right, is that better? Yes. Okay, so, um, so this is my mom and my dad on the morning of their wedding. Um, he had just graduated from the University of Pennsylvania, and soon after that happened, uh, the, the Japanese uh, bombed Pearl Harbor, and he signed up for the Navy. He's wearing his ensign's badge there, and uh, he met my mom on a blind date soon after that. On the second date, he asked her to marry him. And remarkably, she actually said yes, but you have to get permission from my dad. That was back then that happened, I guess. Um, so um, they went over to her house and woke up her dad. <laughs> and he came downstairs and my dad and my grandfather spoke for a couple of hours and, and well into the middle of the night and finally I think he war my dad wore him down um, and he said yes. They got married very soon after that in this picture, that was their wedding and right after their wedding they were on a train to my father's officer training. That was their honeymoon. Uh, as soon as they got there she got right back on the train and came back to lovely Cleveland, Ohio where uh, several weeks later she found out she was pregnant my father was sent to Pearl Harbor to clean it up. He was an engineer. After that, he was actually a, uh, on, on planes in the Pacific Theater, and they would land on islands. He would get out of the plane, lay down protective fire while other people were loading wounded onto the plane. And then, because he was an engineer, as the plane was taking off, he would patch up the plane, which was leaking hydraulic fluid and who knows what else, to try to keep it in the air long enough to get these wounded to where they needed to be. So he came back from, from his tour of duty in, in World War II. Actually, it was the end of the war. He uh, unfortunately never met his first son because his first son died of dysentery, a dysentery outbreak when he was three months old. And he came back, um, and my mom always said when he came back, something was different. He wasn't as outgoing and, and gregarious and, and, uh, as he used to be, and joking as, not as much, and um, a lot of his friends sort of had the same reaction to him. And uh, he never, ever spoke about the war. Now, when he was in his late 60s, he needed to have triple bypass surgery 
And uh, I told you that his planes were landing on these islands, and, and somebody had to make these makeshift runways for these planes on these islands. And so uh, he woke up in the recovery area next to somebody, and they started talking, and they realized that the guy that he woke up next to was one of the guys who laid, he was the chief that laid down these makeshift runways. So they had a lot to talk about. The nurses couldn't shut them up. They were just unloading on each other. But as soon as a family member came in the room, dead silence. So several years later, my father unfortunately was diagnosed with cancer. I was just finishing up the laboratory work uh, for my PhD here in Portland. They live down in San Diego. And uh, I decided I needed to go be with him. So I packed everything I had up. I moved down there. My mother was intent on keeping him alive by any means possible. He had uh, metastases in his liver, and so they told him if he drank, it would really damage him. But he really wanted to have a beer. And so I snuck him out of the house. We never said anything to my mom. She would have killed us. Um, and over uh, several weeks, he told me stories from his experiences, both in Pearl Harbor and, and in the Pacific. Um, and he saw some really horrific things. And finally, I understood why, when I was a child, we were living uh, briefly on Maui, and we were, he was back in Hawaii, which I think was triggering in itself, but we were there on the 4th of July, and he'd fallen asleep on the couch, and all of a sudden there was this big bang, and he I thought he was gonna jump through the ceiling. He was in a, a mode to, a protective mode. He was really like ready to jump, and I never really understood why until I finally understood his story. So, so many people are dealing with this, uh, both combat veterans and people from, who are not combat veterans. Um, one of the reasons I want to dedicate this to combat veterans, though, is that the very bulk of the research that I think is really solid has been uh, through VA-sponsored studies with uh, combat veterans who are experiencing this. But I think it benefits everybody who is suffering from trauma. So to understand this, I think we got to start with figuring out what fear is and fear is all about. And fear is defined, as you see here, as this unpleasant emotion that is caused by the belief or realization that someone or something is likely to do you harm or cause you pain. Um, so this is something that we all have. Um, our big question is to what degree is this something we just have naturally? There are certain things we do see as fearful responses, startle responses, for example, if you hear a loud noise or see a bright flash, it can cause a startle response or a puff of air can even do that to some degree. Um, and Darwin said that this is an adaptive response. Well, that makes sense because if you experience something that's dangerous and become fearful of it, of course, you'll avoid it. Um, now, there are people in this world who um, don't quite get that um, some of them actually have an, an inability to process fear. Um, and interestingly, a lot of them are actually Darwin Award winners. Um, <laughs> um, I'm not letting anybody hold my beer. Uh, so, so this is important that we learn fear. And, and that's the question, then, how much of fear is learned? And, and it turns out that most of the things we fear are, in fact, learned. It's, it's, it's a, we see something and we react to it and it's embedded in our memory for a very long time. Now, how does this happen? Well, we really have to go back to classical conditioning experiments to understand that. Um, and I think most of you have heard of Pavlov. This is him right here. And he had some dogs. And uh, one day he apparently noticed that uh, the people who bring the food in for the dog could by themselves, just by entering the room, cause some of the dogs to start salivating, even if they didn't have food with them. So he started thinking, maybe I can somehow condition my dogs to salivate with other types of stimuli. And so he did this famous experiment where you have the dog with the food salivating, and then you have a dog with a bell. And if you ring a bell, the dog does not salivate, usually. That would be kind of strange if he did. Um, <laughs> Um, he may look at it and he may sniff at it or perk his ears up, but uh, hopefully not, uh, not salivate. But if you were to now every time bring food into the room and ring a bell at the same time, after several of these repetitions, eventually you can ring the bell and now the dog will start to salivate. So in this experiment, 
Uh, the bell is what we call the neutral stimulus at the beginning of the experiment. Um, and then the food is the unconditioned stimulus, which is resulting in the unconditioned response, which is drooling, right, salivating. Now if you take the bell and the food together, now you have the bell as a conditioned stimulus, uh, and then the conditioned response becomes salivating in response to the bell. Now, so this is classical conditioning experiments, and this was done, you know, a long time ago. Uh, and people started asking, well, if it works in dogs, can it work in humans? And a rather famous experiment uh, involved a baby who was nicknamed Little Albert, that wasn't his name. And Little Albert was actually, by all, everybody, no one's really sure how Little Albert wound up in the hands of these two researchers. It's a little bit of a mystery. <clears throat> Um, uh, he was in a pediatric ward, um, and uh, there's some suspicion that he was just randomly chosen and, and taken from the ward. There's another story that says his nurse was somebody, his mother was a nurse there and said, oh sure, it's for science, you know, take my child. Um, the experiment has a lot of problems, it has a sample size of one, um, and uh, uh, a lot of ethical issues, of course, as well. <laughs> so this is the work of John Watson and Rosalie Rayner, 1920. And what they did with poor little Albert was, before conditioning, they would bring furry creatures into the room. A white rat, a white cat, a dog, a monkey. Who knows where they got a monkey? But, um, <laughs> but they had a monkey. Um, and uh, let him kind of explore them, and he had no fear. He was, had no fear at all, it was fine. These didn't freak him out, so he was good with all these little furry creatures. He was very interested in them, just like the dog probably was in the bell. And then, of course, what they did was uh, some other type of stimulus, which in this case is uh, the unconditioned stimulus, which was to hit a steel bar with a hammer, which made a horribly loud sound, which caused an incredible startle response, which caused little Albert to cry. Yes. <clears throat> now, what they did then was they brought in the white rat, and every time they brought in the white rat, they would hit the steel bar with a hammer. And they did this after several, several times, um, and they were still getting this conditioning, natural response, but eventually what would happen was they would bring in the white rat, and now little Albert would cry whenever he saw the white rat. Now, sadly, little Albert was let go after that. So um, we don't really know what happened to little Albert or how truly fucked up he was as a result of this. Um, there's a couple of different stories. Um, there's a couple of different stories. One is that, that uh, he was actually uh, a patient in the hospital and had some minor hydrocephalus, but that doesn't really hold up. And then there was another where he was, like I said, the son of uh, one of the nurses there but he disappeared. People tried to find him and he disappeared. So no one really knows what happened to poor little Albert and, and how, how he reacted to furry things. So the question then was though, if we had stuck around a little bit and tried to fix little Albert, um, could that have happened? Now, it can happen naturally. So one of the things we know about this fear response is that it goes away on its own to some degree. So we call that fear extinction. So over time, that stimulus of the white rat gets weaker and weaker until eventually we get a happy little Albert again when he sees the white rat. Maybe not as happy as before, but he's still, he's still okay with it. So this is a, a process called fear extinction and it does happen. Now, another thing you can do though when fear extinction by itself doesn't, uh, doesn't work is you can do something where you're conditioning now a pleasant response with an unpleasant response. You're pairing them together. So say you have a fear of rabbits. Um, and you see the conditioned stimulus, fear of rabbits, and you're not happy. That's what you're seeing in the top there. Now you bring in some milk and cookies. And hopefully the subject likes milk and cookies. And if he does, he'll smile, and he's okay, like you, like you see here. And now what you do is you bring in the rabbit, and every time you bring in the rabbit, you feed the subject milk and cookies. And then finally, after a while, you can bring the rabbit in, and you get that conditioned response, because there's that expectation of milk and cookies, and you know that's a good thing. Now, this is actually the basis for a type of therapy for anxiety disorders called exposure therapy. You're exposing the subject to the thing that's traumatic, but you're trying to get them to divert that, that reaction uh, to something positive. You're unpairing it with a negative traumatic event. So what happens 
when we have fear? What physiological changes happen in our bodies when we have fear? So one of the things that happens is uh, we start to release stress hormones. Fear is a stressful thing. Um, so the stress hormones that, are, that I'm going to talk about tonight, there are many different neurotransmitters and changes that happen, but I'm really going to focus on one group of them, and that is um, what's called the hypothalamic pituitary uh, adrenal axis, HPA. Um, from the hypothalamus, corticotropin releasing hormone, or CRH, is released, um, and that stimulates the pituitary gland. And from the pituitary gland, another hormone called adrenocorticotropic hormone, or ACTH, is released, and that gets through the bloodstream and stimulates the adrenal glands, which are just on the top of your kidneys, and they release cortisol. Now, cortisol is a major stress hormone, um, and it's meant to only be elevated in the body transiently for a short time, okay? Now, short-term cortisol, along with other things like epinephrine or adrenaline, uh, are part of the fight or flight response. So, for some reason, whenever I was learning about this in school, from high school all the way through medical school, they always talked about walking into a cave with a bear. I don't know why, but that was always the example they gave us. It's never something like modern, right? It had to be a cave and a bear. <laughs> so you walk into the cave, and you're, you're just happily humming along, and all of a sudden you see a bear, and the bear is mean and nasty, and it looks at you like food. And then you have to decide, am I going to run away, run like hell to get away from here, or am I going to stay and fight this bear? Which, by the way, is a very stupid thing to do. <laughs> now, um, what you're, what's happening is all these chemicals are changing the physiology of your body to do either of those things. So cortisol prepares the body for fight by really um, flooding it with glucose. So you're getting all this energy uh, to large muscles, all right? It's also altering your insulin production in an attempt to prevent that glucose from being stored. Um, and it's also narrowing your, narrowing your arteries. And now epinephrine or adrenaline is also causing your heart to beat faster. So now it's pumping blood much harder, all right? So your heart is, is pounding away. So this is what happens. And then you're supposed to run away from the bear or fight the bear. And if you survive the fight or run away and are successful, your cortisol levels eventually come back down and all is well in the world. The problem is, if you have chronically elevated cortisol, it's linked to a lot of very nasty physiological things. Um, and this is just a non-exhaustive list here. Um, in terms of uh, neurological changes, uh, it's been linked to depression, it's, it's been linked to chronic fatigue, sleep deprivation, migraines, uh, hostility, but it's also been linked to metabolic disease, predisposition towards diabetes, um, arthritis, decreased immune function, and other problems. So having cortisol high for a long time is a bad thing for your body. When does that happen? It happens when you have trauma. So trauma is a little different from fear, and this is the definition for trauma. It's an event that you have experienced or witnessed. You don't even have to experience it yourself. You can see it. Um, that involves actual or threatened death or very serious injury, um, or a threat to the physical integrity of someone. And this comes in many different forms. Having a diagnosis of cancer and living through a cancer diagnosis, for example, can cause trauma. Uh, being in a car accident can cause trauma. Because what's, in each of these cases, a person's response is intense fear and even horror because of the potential loss of your life or the life of people around you, as well as helplessness. And of course, what we see in combat is often this kind of trauma as well. Now, most people, after they've had a traumatic event, develop something called post-traumatic stress. Now, this isn't PTSD. This is just a, a really pretty normal reaction to stress. So you're, you're going to have an increased heart rate for at least some time following this event because you're just amped up. Uh, you're going to be very nervous. You're going to have nightmares. Um, you're you're going to have uh, sort of a, a sense of wanting to get away from this traumatic event uh, and avoid it at all costs. So if you're in a car accident, some people actually for some time really want to avoid driving because they get very nervous around cars. Now, what's interesting is this is linked to very short-term elevation of cortisol, short-term being longer than what I just mentioned before in the fight or flight response situation, but longer, but not as long as PTSD. So your cortisol is elevated for maybe weeks, 
Um, and your symptoms associated with this event usually last weeks to maybe a month, but then they resolve. And there's really not a reason to try a therapeutic approach in this case because it does resolve on its own. It's actually pretty natural, and it's part of developing fear memory, which is a good thing. So, so that's okay, but the problem comes when the, the tra trauma that you have is so repetitive or so intense or you are just predisposed towards this for some reason or another, it doesn't just become PTS, it becomes PTSD. And what's happening in PTSD is different. Now, you are really re-experiencing this traumatic event um, with nightmares and just and, uh, flashbacks and everything else uh, quite frequently. You're having emotional numbing just to everything around you. Um, you're having problems with anger. You're having problems with concentration. You're hypervigilant because you're expecting it to happen again anytime. And you start to see significant personality changes and triggers, really significant triggers of these events that may not be associated with the event itself. And that's a significant problem for people with PTSD. They see something that is somehow indirectly linked and they really generalize these stimuli that will trigger their PTSD. So in a person who doesn't have PTSD, what you see are all those hormones I mentioned before, coming from the hypothalamus to the pituitary and then down to the adrenal gland. Cortisol feeds back on the pituitary and the hypothalamus to sort of self-regulate its release. But when you have PTSD, everything goes out of whack. All these hormonal circuits are elevated or decreased in abnormal ways, and cortisol in particular becomes very high to the point where it starts to feed on other centers of the brain. And the two I really want to talk about tonight are the amygdala and the hypothalamus. So what's happening in those two parts of the brain? Normally, when you have some sort of emotional situation, the amygdala system takes, takes that into, into account, and it's involved in what we call implicit emotional memory, and that could be fear memory. Okay. The hippocampal system is a system that's really involved in uh, different types of learning and memory. It's involved in pattern separation, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, and when you activate it, it's really involved in explicit memory about some emotional situation that you're having. So you have these two different centers that are linked together anatomically uh, and functionally, and they help you understand what's fearful, and it helps you sort out what in a situation should be considered fearful from what should not be. So the problem is when you have trauma, these stimuli are much higher. Cortisol is pouring onto these centers and changing the way these centers activate and inhibiting some of the, the activation in those areas of the brain. So what does this look like? We can actually put people with PTSD uh, under imaging and, and look at their brains. So how many of you have had an MRI? I'm, I'm su suspecting some of you. So you know that's not the most pleasant experience. You're put into this hole, and it's extraordinarily loud, um, but you can actually get people to calm down and put noise-canceling headphones on them, and you can project images or sounds or whatever in there and then look at what's happening in the brain. Most of you have had a structural MRI, but a functional MRI is actually doing something different. It's actually looking at the diameter of very small capillaries and blood vessels in the brain. So when nerve cells need to fire to do something like react to fear, um, they need energy, and they get that from the blood. And so when they're active, they actually signal to the bloodstream nearby to make those, those arteries and, and vessels much wider. They increase the diameter. And these machines can actually measure that. And when they do that, this is actually a picture of a brain listening to music versus sitting in silence. So those red areas that are lit up are all areas that turn on in someone listening to music. So these machines are really amazing, and the imaging is incredible. So what's going on then in the brain of somebody who has PTSD? And so if you look at that, this is just an example. This is from a study of, of combat veterans who have recently returned with PTSD. This is the amygdala and the hippocampus. And they're chronically high in terms of their activity in, in people who are suffering with PTSD. So that's, that's not supposed to be happening. Right? That, sh that should not be a highlight on this picture. So what's going on? to cause all these things, and how could that help us understand how to reverse it? Well, coming back to chronically elevated cortisol, one of the things we know that chronically elevated cortisol does is it kills off or prevents the cell division of neural stem cells. 
And these are cells that have been linked when they're abnormal to learning and memory problems, uh, to depression, and to persistent PTSD, which raises the question, what's a neural stem cell? So uh, these cells are, here's an actual movie. That is an actual neural stem cell growing in a Petri dish. That's going to divide in a second now. If you wait, let's see, here it goes. And bam, there, now you have two. And they're going to keep dividing. And what's important about these cells is that they don't know what they want to be yet when they grow up. They haven't decided. So what they're doing is they're undergoing a process called symmetric cell division. One cell is dividing and giving rise to two more stem cells. Now eventually, these things can get very big, or we can treat them with proteins. Or if they're in your brain, this will happen naturally, of course. And instead of asymmetric, I mean symmetric division, they'll start to undergo asymmetric division, where one neural stem cell arises, but the other daughter of that, of that division is a cell that's going to become a nerve cell. Okay. So these cells are in our brains um, and uh, are capable of giving rise to all the different cells in the brain, all the neurons, and another group of cells called glial cells, which people thought were very unimportant for the longest time, even though they account for 70% of your brain. Um, and it turns out they're very, very important, because I study them, you know, so they are. Um, so, um, so, um, so these cells are, are capable of two things. They're capable of self-renewal, and they're capable of turning into multiple different types of cells. Now, the first evidence that we had neural stem cells in the adult brain came in 1965. And that was from a study from two guys, Altman and Doss, who um, had rats, and they had two pairs of rats. Uh, one group was sitting in their cages like couch potatoes, um, and the other group were trying to learn something, a maze. And they inject, their, their hypothesis of this experiment was cell division may have to occur for learning to occur in parts of the brain. Now, neurons, the electrical units of our brain, once they are born, they don't divide anymore. They're done. Their division days are over, right? So they were actually thinking it might have been some of these glial cells, perhaps, that were dividing. So they injected these mice with, or these rats, rather, with um, uh, a substance that was only taken up by dividing cells, and then they isolated the brain. That's a brain, not a turkey. And, um, and then they looked in this part of the brain I just mentioned, the hippocampus, involved in learning and memory. And what they found was that there were all these cells um, here uh, that were dividing recently, but they were neurons. So the only way that could have possibly have occurred was if these were a dividing population of cells that weren't neurons, that during the course of this experiment turned into neurons. And I should say this only happened in the rats that were learning the maze. It didn't happen in the couch potato rats. And so they postulated that this was evidence of adult neurogenesis, neuro neuron genesis to create, to form new neurons, right? And nobody believed it. This totally went against the dogma of science. You think, you think Catholics are bad about dogma? Uh, <laughs> scientists are worse. So, People threw this paper away. They said there must have been some artifact, some technical problem that they had. It couldn't be real. And then something remarkable happened in 1978. The 78 Stingray was released, which was a great car. <laughs> and the 78 Schwinn Stingray bicycle came out that year, another great and new, new version of that bicycle, and a really great movie called Stingray. I don't know if you can read this, but the, the slogan up at the talk is, get wrecked, get chased, get smashed, get it on. The big red hot one is in town. <laughs> I do not know why that did not get an Academy Award. It was just such a great film. So it was a banner year for Stingrays, except for the Stingrays in this one laboratory who gave their lives to demonstrate that adult neurogenesis happens in the stingray nervous system throughout life. And that was really cool, and nobody doubted it because the study was very well done, and uh, nobody cared because they were stingrays. <laughs> so a few years went by, and something else happened, and that was people were studying songbirds. Now, songbirds, it turns out, learn songs from each other seasonally. So some bird somewhere is making up these songs, and then other birds come and learn the songs, and they teach them to each other. I don't know who's doing the making up of the songs, but, but 
but they do this. So they gave these birds drugs that actually inhibit cell division. Same kinds of drugs we give to cancer patients. And guess what? The birds couldn't learn new songs. Then what they did was they looked at the brains of those birds, the bird brains, yes, um, <laughs> and what they found was that the hippocampus was altered. There was no gener there's a, a de deficit in cells in the animals that had received this drug. And actually, I don't know how many of you have ever had to take high-dose chemotherapy, but people on high-dose chemotherapy often develop a, a condition called chemo brain or chemo fog, where they have a learning and memory problem as a result of the therapy, not as a result of their cancer. So long story short, we now know this happens in mammals, including humans. And in fact, the really remarkable thing is that this neurogenesis that's happening in our brains, in our hippocampus, is critical for learning and memory. If you impair that neurogenesis any time in life, you will have impaired learning and memory. And in fact, you're capable of doing it up until the day you die if you're pushing yourself. And you could live to be just shy of 124, which is now the oldest known human being, was just shy of 124. And you are still capable of inducing neurogenesis in the hippocampus. So this is what it looks like. This is actually a section through a brain of a mouse that had been learning a maze. And what you see are these blue cells are the cell nuclei of differentiated neurons. This is the area where all the stem cells hang out. And these are newborn neurons that are making new circuits that are in, in actually integrating and forming new memory. Pretty remarkable. So what's going on here? And how does this have, what does this have to do with PTSD? Well, the first thing is that there's uh, the sense that there's this, this function of the hippocampus that may be involved in trying to you know, help you discriminate from things that you should be afraid from in a situation from things you shouldn't be. How is it that you could you know, walk into a situation, something awful happens, and you really don't be, you're not afraid of all the other things that are in that room when you see them again later, only the possibility that something's gonna happen specifically regarding the trauma that you're experiencing. So this is in this pattern separation thing I was talking to you about. And this is a situation that was shown in a number of experiments where you take a mouse and you put them in a box that has very specific features in it, like this really beautiful purple pattern here. And they have a floor where that's electrical current can run through. And whenever they shine a yellow light in the box, they give the mouse a little shock. That's not enough to really hurt the mouse. It's just a little uncomfortable shock, enough to make it a little bit afraid of being there. So you do this a few times, and now you go back and look at some animals that have had damage to the hippocampus, or animals who have not. And what they find is that the animals that don't have damage to the hippocampus, if you shine now a blue light, they're fine. They explore the cage, they lick their feet, they check it out, and they just don't care that you're shining a light on them. Um, and so they're exploring, and this is a high level of exploration, which means they're good at discriminating the shock from a, just light in general. So just anything about the context of their space is not gonna cause fear. But animals that have this hippocampal problem demonstrate freezing, and now you have generalization, very poor pattern separation, and what they're doing is they're just, any light now is causing them to respond in that conditioned way, just like little Albert, um, to the stimulus. So this tells you that it's, it's, it's the shock is what you should be afraid of. Um, it should be a yellow light that you're afraid of, but these animals can't discriminate. It's any sort of stimulus that's even remotely similar that causes that response. Now the same thing has been done in humans, usually using college students who will do anything for pizza. And what they've done is they've taken people and they've given a little finger attachment to them. And when they walk into this room, they get a shock on their finger. And they do that over and over again. And then eventually you have a group of people who are, having, who are known to have uh, some anxiety issues. And when you look at these people, you can measure their skin conductance, which is sort of a measure of their stress and fear. So people who have problems with this have skin conductance levels that are low and you get, or increased rather, and you get generalization, bad pattern separation. Whenever they walk into this room, their fear levels increase. But people who are doing fine walk into this room and they can separate the, the stimulus from the stimuli of the visual information they get from the room. Their skin conductance is normal. 
they have good pattern separation and good discrimination, okay? So interestingly, little Albert had evidence of pretty significant generalization. I mentioned that the white rat caused little Albert to cry. It turns out that just about anything furry after that experiment caused little Albert to cry. And he even, uh, Dr. Watson even came into the room with a white Santa Claus beard and that caused him to cry. So can you imagine, maybe little Albert was Jewish and it was okay, I don't know, but, <laughs> but, but although I, I'm Jewish and, and Santa Claus made me cry, so I don't know. Um, <laughs> They were kind of freaky, actually. I don't know, but the Easter, the Easter Bunny was a lot weirder, though, I have to tell you. So poor little Albert, you know, he really was responding to a generalized stimulus, and his, his fear levels were generalized. Now, when you're a baby, of course, neurogenesis is very different than when you're an adult. So this could have been sorted out later in life. Who knows? So this neurogenesis effect is very interesting. So when people have looked at this, They've been able to link this specifically to changes in neurogenesis in the hippocampus. So here's a situation where you have low cortisol, and we should know that low cortisol does not impact the dentate gyrus, this neurogenesis that's happening. So you get some ambiguous sensory input, and it goes through various sensory centers, and those then signal to the dentate gyrus, where there's lots of normal neurogenesis going on. And in one part of the hippocampus, uh, that projects to other parts of the brain, and you get improved contextual processing and good pattern separation. Now, on the other end of the hippocampus, you also have this neurogenesis happening in the ventral part of it. Uh, this is projecting to other parts of the brain, including the hypothalamus, which I've mentioned, and the amygdala, um, and prefrontal cortex, and that causes reduced fear and stress responses. You're separating those patterns, and now you have low anxiety because you have good discrimination of the different stimuli. But when you have high cortisol, this blocks neurogenesis. You go from this nice, all these red cells here, to very little to no neurogenesis happening in this part of the hippocampus, the dentate gyrus. Now you have this ambiguous sensory input. Um, the dorsal part is causing impaired contextual processing, bad pattern separation. The ventral part is causing increased fear and stress. And together, that leads to very poor general discrimination um, very high generalization and high anxiety. Okay, so this, this really tells you that by changing, the cortisol is functioning in part by really impacting on neurogenesis. So the next thing I want to get to is why is it that some people get PTSD while others don't? You can take five people who are in a room where the same event happened and only two of them develop PTSD and the other three don't. Why, why would that be? Same intensity of, uh, of incidents? Well, of course, there's a lot of reasons. The intensity of the trauma could be a reason. One person in the room might be closer to the event and be more impacted by it. Number of exposures. It could be that those two people who got PTSD in the room have been through this before, and they're just kind of reaching their limit, right? Also, there are differences in coping mechanisms. The way we deal with world, the stress in the world will impact our reaction to trauma, traumatic events. But finally, there's something interesting that's arising in the field, and that is that there may be genetic susceptibility towards things like PTSD and other anxiety disorders. So a number of genes have been linked to PTSD uh, liability. Um, one that's most talked about is this one. It's called SL66A4. I know a very descriptive and helpful name. <laughs> so this is the serotonin transporter gene. So when you have nerve connections between nerve cells, there's a synapse. The synapse is actually a space between the two cells. So this is the end of one neuron called the axon, and this is the terminal. And in this part of the neuron, the nerve cell, there are these yellow balls you see here that are filled with chemicals we call neurotransmitters. I mentioned one already, epinephrine or adrenaline. Another one is serotonin. And the serotonin, in this case, is being released into this space and it travels across the space and it's taken up by other proteins on this cell. This is another neuron in the circuit. Um, and then the, 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 the uh, circuit continues on its merry way. Now, what's interesting is that not all of the serotonin gets taken up by the other cell. And so there's excess neurotransmitter in that space, excess serotonin. And there are these little red proteins here that bind to the green proteins and actually recycle them. It's a very green type of process, really, if you think about it. 
So they actually recycle the serotonin. Um, and that's important because if that doesn't happen, you get excess serotonin building up in that space. And now you get this kind of constant abnormal signaling happening. And that actually does happen. So there are people who have very small changes uh, in the protein structure of this gene, this red protein here, that don't effectively take up the serotonin very well. And as a result of that, that predisposes you towards more things like PTSD. So um, a lot of the drugs that we, and I'll talk about that in a moment, that we use on patients, in fact, are, in, are involving in serotonin reuptake. So there are um, a number of functions that serotonin has been implicated in, including clinical depression, OCD, romantic love, which many people think is a disease, um, <laughs> hypertension, uh, and phobic anxiety. So phobic anxiety is, should be a red flag if you're studying this, right? So this all kind of makes sense. Now, there are a number of other genes that have also been linked to PTSD, but the, the correlations are not nearly as good in some of these cases. Other neurotransmitters have been implicated. Um, the opioid receptor like one gene, which is involved, as it's, the name suggests, in opioid signaling, so pleasure signaling. Uh, so you can imagine that if you have problems with pleasure processing, that that could be uh, adding to stressful situation. Uh, there's something called the pituitary adenyl cyclase activating peptide, or PACAP. And as its name suggests, this is a pituitary peptide that regulates the release of a number of things, including hormones, like stress hormones. And then there are a number of mitochondrial genes, interestingly, uh, that have been implicated. Mitochondrial, the mitochondria is this, the powerhouse of the cell. And if you have problems with the mitochondria, it makes cells more susceptible to death. I mentioned that cortisol can kill neuro, neural stem cells. So if those cells have a mitochondrial problem, they're going to be more likely to die than ones that don't. So there's a number of different ways you can have a genetic susceptibility to this. So why do some people get PTSD? Maybe it's because they have a genetic liability towards anxiety disorders. That's not something they can really help. Now, the next thing I want to ask is, I mentioned genes. Now, genes are made up of a four-letter code, um, A's, T's, C's, and G's, for adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. They bond to each other, and they form this beautiful double helix, which Rosalind Franklin uh, showed, not Watson and Crick. And what we know is that in our bodies and cells, unless there's a mutation that occurs, which is like something that happens, for example, in cancer, uh, in, the, in adult life, for example, um, these signals don't change. And there's no evidence that traumatic, uh, stressful injuries cause this type of change, an actual genetic change. But there is evidence of something called an epigenetic change. Now, epigenetics means around the gene, which means you're changing something about the gene. And it turns out that one of those changes involves adding a methyl group, uh, shown here, this ME, to some of the Cs. Now, most of, most of our DNA does not code for anything. Uh, it's actually regulatory. So these, these Cs that are being methylated are happening in regulatory parts of genes and deciding whether the gene should be turned on or off. When you add a methyl group to a gene, it's generally turning the gene off, okay? So there's good evidence that these things now change over the lifespan and can be influenced by things that happen to us. Another thing that can happen is changes in histones. Histones are proteins that DNA wraps around, and they also can have chemical changes. We call them acet acetylation. And changes in histone acetylation can also turn genes on or off. Okay. And the reason for that is that, see how it's, the DNA is wrapped around these things? It has to kind of unwind a little bit for the cell machinery to be able to read the DNA code and then make RNA, and the RNA makes protein. So there's a, good, a lot of good data showing that, in fact, these things change as a result of stress. So for example, uh, there was a study on uh, social isolation in adolescence uh, and showing that this alters neuronal development in a way that depends on changes in DNA methylation of certain neuron-specific genes. That's pretty remarkable. The other thing that's been shown is that histone acetylation changes only after three days of maternal separation in neonatal mice. So you take the, the babies away from the mom, three days later you can, you can actually see changes in acetylation in neuronal genes. 
and that can change the way the brain is patterned, the cells. Now, there's been several studies done on people with PTSD, and a number of genes have been popping up. Not a lot of data on the acetylation part of things, but there is good data on the DNA methylation. And one of the things we see is that stress response genes, genes involved in neurotransmitter regulation, for example, serotonin, genes involved in immune cell regulation, people with stress tend to get sick a lot easier, right? Genes involved in cortisol-related stress responses, these genes are all becoming hypermethylated in people with PTSD. Now, remarkably, some of you may remember hearing stories about Lamarckian genetics, where people had this idea, like, if we cut off rats' tails, eventually we'll get rats with short tails. Well, that doesn't happen. But what does happen is you get rats that are now very fearful of people with a cleaver. <laughs> and what's really interesting about that experiment is it may be heritable. So that change leads to stress, DNA methylation, for example, and that in turn can lead to a heritable fear of certain types of situations. So it may not be the cleaver per se, but they may learn to fear the cleaver a lot faster than their parents did as a result of these genetic alterations, these epigenetic alterations. So the question is, is, is PTSD somehow causing changes in our offspring and their offspring, perhaps? It's not entirely clear. Um, the children of Auschwitz survivors, interestingly, have changes that are clearly epigenetic. Um, and it's a horse and a cart problem because, of course, those people had a lot of problems you know, with anxiety and depression. You're growing up with that, and how does that impact how your genes are being expressed? But there is data from animal studies showing that, in fact, DNA methylation changes can be passed on. So that leads to a question of, of again, can you increase the liability for PTSD because someone in your past has experienced something traumatic? So we want to end then with how do we treat this? And um, I'm going to talk about uh, studies where there's been good data involving a large population of people. Now, uh, many of you have actually used alternative therapies, I'm sure. And uh, there's that old joke, you know, about the guy who goes to the doctor and, and uh, the doctor says, you know, whenever I do this, it hurts. And the doctor says, well, don't do this. Um, and I think... There are therapies that work for some people, and there are therapies that don't work for some people. And we can't have a one-size-fits-all therapeutic approach. But I am going to talk about the therapies that are being used widely and where good studies have shown that there are good results for a large proportion of people. For acute PTSD, where you really are having a lot of the symptoms but are, are having just difficulty controlling it, it's not so intrusive that it's beyond beyond your ability to cope altogether, people re uh, really uh, recommend cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, and that can be very effective. For severe and chronic forms of PTSD, there's combinations of cognitive behavioral therapy, group therapy, and medication to help you at least get over the hump sometimes. Um, so these are sort of the, the standards of care in the Western medical community. Now, cognitive behavioral therapy is really focused on separating these intrusive thoughts that you may have about this event that's happened to you um, from all the anxiety that they, they induce. So trying to get you to stop having this reaction. Now exposure therapy, we already talked about a little bit, and this is a little different. It's another form of cognitive behavioral therapy, but it's really about understanding your reactions to these things and trying to pair the trauma with exposing you to the trauma and trying to pair your, your uh, uh, sense of that trauma or that event with something that's not the event itself. So you're trying to really switch the way your brain is thinking about that, that and try to reduce the panic that results from it. There's another therapy that's um, growing in popularity, EMDR, or Eye Movement Desensitization and Reprocessing. And this is where you're actually doing something, uh, usually it was originally done with eye movement, although that appears, appears not to be so critical, but maybe hand movements or gestures or uh, touching your palm or doing other things. Uh, in response to the traumatic uh, events or feelings. Um, and it seems to work pretty well for some people, but again, not for everybody. So of these three, cognitive therapy works the best uh, for combat veterans, for example. Exposure therapy is kind of second best, and some people respond to one and not the other. Now, 
medications are numerous, and some work and some don't, and some make things worse and some make things better, and um, it's sort of all over the place. Most of the ones that are widely used are serotonin reuptake inhibitors. So you're altering that serotonin accumulation in the synapse, and they uh, affect the concentration and activity of serotonin. They can reduce depression. Um, they can help you with these uh, symptoms that you develop, uh, with your anger management and explosive outbursts, the uh, hypervigilance that you experience. And the FDA has approved these for a number of anxiety disorders, including PTSD. One of the places where it's a problem, these drugs, is treatment of adolescents, because they were all developed in adults. And you probably have heard in the news how some of these things can actually make things much worse um, and, in class, and, in, and in, can induce uh, suicidal ideation uh, in some adolescents. And the problem is, it's actually only been the last 20 years or so that we've, we've really accepted in the psychological and neuroscience community that a teenage brain isn't just a, a young adult brain. It's very much a work in progress. In fact, one of the last places of the brain to connect are the frontal cortex, which is involved in good judgment and all that stuff and executive function, and the amygdala, which is why you should never give car keys to teenage boys. Um, <laughs> Because the amygdala is this you know, responsive, angry center and fear center and everything else. And it, the connection is actually the myelination, which allows for fast conduction between these two centers of the brain. It's not done in the boy's brain until they're in their 20s. Girls, it's earlier. And that's obvious, I think. Um, <laughs> now, there are numerous alternative therapies, and I'm not listing them all here. Uh, one that's been in the news lately and discussed a lot is... Uh, giving people with PTSD ecstasy. <laughs> now, um, this is actually being driven largely by um, one person, interestingly, here in the US. Uh, and it's just finished a clinical trial. And the clinical trial was unblinded, and uh, it had pretty fair results. Um, there was another clinical trial in Europe using MDMA, uh, which is the other word for ecstasy. And um, they actually saw no effect. That's kind of good news in my mind because I would worry that MDA may actually have the opposite. It may make things much worse in somebody. But, but actually, the, the good news is, is at least in the European study, it didn't have any effect. In the US study, it may have some positive effects. And they're right now trying to fund a, a phase three clinical trial. So we'll see. Um, I think the jury is still out on that. But there's other methods that have been fairly well documented. Meditation probably is the one that has the most weight behind it in terms of studies, and it works very well for some people, especially mantra rep repetition, where you're focusing on this phrase. Acupuncture, the data are, are not good. Um, I think, again, this is one of those situations, like if you're doing acupuncture and you're finding it helps you, don't stop. Uh, but the data are not good in terms of uh, the, having actual real benefit. Relaxation therapy is very iffy, and there's been quite a few studies done in VA centers on this, and some people get help from it, again, some don't. So it's hard to know where that's going. And then yoga, there's actually been a couple of people, including a pretty prominent neuroscientist who claims that yoga is a way to help, and I think yoga probably could be helpful, um, especially in conjunction with cognitive behavioral therapy. And so I think there's a number of things you can do that if it works for you. And I think the most important thing is to find a therapist who you like, who you have a good relationship with, um, and who is willing to help you devise a therapeutic plan that works for you. Now, there are people who really cannot get over this. And that means we still need more treatment options for people with PTSD and other types of anxiety disorders that are very severe. I mentioned the whole methyl DNA methylation thing. Well, it turns out we already have good drugs that can alter DNA methylation. And the reason for that is some genes involved in cancer are, uh, are, due to, are, are changed because of DNA methylation changes. And so people have devised drugs to change DNA methylation in genes, and they're being used in the clinic. So could we make targeted drugs that altered the methylation status of some of these neuronal genes? Um, the answer is yes, we could. Uh, have we done it yet? No, we haven't. But the data are very good that this DNA methylation it could be one of the reasons why some people really have troubles getting past the, the problems that they're, they're suffering from. Now, the other thing is, could we somehow 
help people by altering that neurogenesis I talked about? Could we boost neurogenesis somehow uh, in patients that have these high cortisol levels and get over it somehow or, or, or bring back those cells? Well, this is where my own research comes in remarkably. And we've been studying neurogenesis in the adult for some time. <clears throat> and we have been looking at a protein that has the very helpful and descriptive name again of CD44. Now, CD44 used to be called Hermes. Hermes was the messenger of the gods. What a great name for a protein. And I went to read college, so I was a liberal arts major, and you know that was great having Hermes in my pocket there. It was kind of nice. And we were studying, actually, the interactions between Hermes and another protein called Merlin. So we had this mixed mythology thing going, which was really awesome. But unfortunately, now we're stuck with CD44. <laughs> now, CD44, what it does is it's on the outside of cells, and it's on the outside of neural stem cells. And it's kind of like an antenna, and it's sensing things that are in the, the kind of the matrix around the cell. And it turns out the place in the hippocampus where those cells reside has just that matrix that CD44 is an antenna for. And so we've been looking at this, and what we find is that if we turn down the CD44 gene in these neural stem cells, we can get them to start producing more neural stem cells much more rapidly. So what you see here, remember those balls of cells in that movie I showed you, dividing? They form those neurospheres, they call them. And this is what happens in a normal, a normal mouse neurosphere. Uh, and this is what happens when you take the CD44 away. You get these Death Star-like neurospheres. They're pretty intense. <laughs> so these are just dividing and rapidly dividing, and we can expand them. And what's cool is we've been able to show, using a drug that we're testing right now, that we can turn this on and off. So could we take somebody who has PTSD, a really severe PTSD, and give them this drug and have them have a burst of new neuron, neuron formation uh, while they're undergoing their cognitive behavioral therapy and help them get through it because now they can induce that pattern separation. They can replace those memories of the event that are so badly paired that where the pattern separation is all wrong and restore it to something more normal. And that's one of the exciting possibilities that, that we'd like to pursue. So I hope that was interesting. Um, I, I hope this was helpful to some people and, and interesting, and thank you for braving the weather to get here. Thanks for listening. This podcast and the Science on Tap events are created by VIA Productions. We have some great topics coming up at our events in the next few months, ranging from the connection between body fat and fertility, and how to talk to your friends about climate change. So if you'd like to find out more about how to attend one of our events in person, check out viaproductions.org. You can also find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash scienceontaporwa. And that last part stands for Oregon and Washington. As always, I'd like to say thank you to my volunteers, the Minions. They've been helping me run events for years, and I couldn't do this without them. The Minions are Scott Fry, Chris Gowan, Jordy Humphrey, Sam Lauk, Rita Nigren, and Stephen Perry, as well as many others who have helped over the years. Thank you so much for everything. Also, a final thank you to Jonathan Colton for letting us use his song Mandelbrot Set as our theme music. You're a heart shaped box of springs and wire and one badass fucking fractal. And you're just in time to save the day.